And I want to take a few moments and attempt to pay a little debt that we have to the Jewish people. I said a little debt. It is a huge debt. You know, you have a Bible, so do I. But 77% of this Bible is Old Testament. Oh, you wouldn't have a lot of Bible if it were not for the Jewish people. But wait a moment. What about the New Testament? 25 of the 27 books in the New Testament are written under God by Jews. So not only you wouldn't have an Old Testament if it weren't for the Jews, you wouldn't have a New Testament either. Only two books by a Gentile, Luke the physician, the Gospel of Luke, and though written by a Gentile, it's all about Jews and the book of Acts. But that's about Jews too. Chapters 1 to 12 in Acts, uh, Peter is right at the forefront. He's the leading character. And chapters 13 to the end of the book, chapter 28, is, by, is about Paul, who was a Jew. So even the books that were not written by a Jew, Luke and Acts, are all about Jews. We have a rich debt to the Jewish people. Have you ever thanked God for them? Have you ever thanked the Jewish people for the Bible that has been so helpful and so precious to you? The very, the very Word of God. And you go through the New Testament books. Synagogues are referred to 60 eight times. Uh, the threads of Judaism uh, constitute the fabric for the New Testament books. There they all are, yes. Uh, which reminds me, in my uh, attempt to get an education along the way, I ended up in a Hebrew class, of course, I wanted to learn Hebrew. But to my sheer delight, the instructor for the Hebrew class was a Jewish man. Ah, yes. And oh, was he a Jew. I remember one day, uh, he comes into the class, and whether it's the proverbial forgetfulness of professors or what, but he came in, and the first words he said were, I forgot my Bible. <laughs> so he was empty-handed. And someone in the class said, well, here, take mine. We were going through the prophecy of Isaiah. He said, that's OK. He turned around toward the blackboard, and he started writing out the whole text that we were studying at that present time. I sat there, my jaw dropped. Not only did he know the Hebrew Old Testament, but he had it in his mind, in his heart, as he flawlessly put the text, of course, from right to left Hebrew goes, and it starts at the back of the book also. But there it was in front of us. So I was privileged to have a master of the Hebrew language as my instructor and professor while I was struggling as a Swede to, to learn Hebrew. And I, I never forgot the lessons of that class. And it has been of great value to me all the way through. Then also, I have a kind of a personal debt to the Jewish people because between 1956 and 2010, 
I have been to Israel ten times. And uh, your reaction may be, would you go to look at the same old stuff? Well, oh, no, no. And uh, it's amazing over the course of those years. Uh, it is, they're always digging up, not something new, but digging up the archaeologists, something old. So there's always something new to see when you go to Israel and always new experiences. Of course, it never quite settles down. In 1956, there was a war. It was the Suez War at that time. Uh, one of many that the Israelis have been involved in since the land was founded and started in 1948. And in fact, some tours were canceled because the people didn't want to go. They were afraid. And so we had a couple people on our tour, which was uh, a study group from the Winona Lake School of Theology. We picked up a couple people who were from canceled tours. And, uh, but we had a good time and learned a lot. And on six of these visits to uh, Israel, I had the responsibility and privilege of being the tour leader and teacher for those visits. Another one of those was very enjoyable. It was in, and the people were always so gracious, and the welcome mat is always out was in 1996. I was there for three, three weeks. Uh, it was the Institute of Holy Land Studies, the uh, actual summer session. There was classroom work, and then there were field trips, and the combination made many things just come alive. And so I've, I have a debt to the Jewish people for reclaiming their land in 1948 and having it open for we Christians to visit and always being gracious to us so much. Some years back, uh, it was in the fall of the year, I was preaching through the Jewish festivals. You find them all uh, in Leviticus chapter 23. And there they are. And we were down to the Sunday that I was going to preach on the Feast of Tabernacles. Or as the Jews would say, the Feast of Booths which is Sukkoth, uh, which is the word for, the Hebrew word for booth, the Feast of Sukkoth. Well, you say, what's that all about? Well, you know, after the Jews left Egypt, they were 40 years wandering around in the Sinai Peninsula, a bleak and barren territory to be sure. And they were on the move constantly because there were a lot of them. Moses was leading three million people. And of course, uh, water was always an issue. You had to have water for the cattle that they had with them. And they had to have water, uh, not only to wash, but to drink. So they had to keep moving from one water hole or well to another. And so it was 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years on the move. They never settled down in one place with the consequent of 40 years. 
A whole generation was raised, but there were no houses. They dwelt in booths. And those booths were throw-togethers, kind of lean-tos, made of natural materials, uh, not real tight, of course. And so they'd sleep in them for a night, but then they'd march on and leave the booth behind and to another place and put up another temporary dwelling. They did not have tents, but they made these booths. And so this became one of the Jewish feasts, the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths, Sukkoth. Well, I was going to preach on that festival the next Sunday, and I thought, I have never been in one of those. And part of the celebration down through the centuries have been the Jews make, making a sukkah and a booth. In fact, when they came to Jerusalem to observe this feast, the hills around Jerusalem were decorated with these booths. So I thought, does my rabbi friend uh, have a sukkah? I was sure he did. Picked up the phone, sure enough, and he said, come on over. So I'm knocking at the front door. He led me through the house and out the back door. And there in the backyard of the rabbi's house in Chicago Lawn, uh, up against the wall, the brick wall of the back house, was his booth observing the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, oh, made of mostly natural things, sort of loose and leafy uh, to represent the ones that the Jews lived in when they were wandering in the wilderness. So we sat and, and talked for a while in his tabernacles there, his booth, and uh, I counted that a privilege and his hospitality was so gracious that just added an extra edge of warmth to the occasion because uh, it's getting a little nippy in the fall in Chicago when the Feast of Tabernacles comes around, yes. So there, there we had it. And then uh, another experience that I had with the Jewish people, again a rabbi, was in 1993. It was in 1993 that when I was pastor of the Ashburn Baptist Church that we were dedicating our Orland Park Sanctuary it was the eighth building program during my 69-year ministry pastorate at Ashburn Baptist. We started in a schoolhouse, so we didn't have any building at all. Met in the Owen School in Chicago. And after about a year, we had a small building up, which was our first building program. But this one, or the Orland Sanctuary, was our eighth building program during all those years to accommodate the people. We had the dedication at the Sunday evening service. And we did something which was most appropriate, but I had never heard of before. At the close of that service, we started reading through the Bible, all of it, because what was the building for? For the proclamation of the Word of God, for the exposition and explanation of the Scriptures, 
So what would be more appropriate than to crown this dedication ceremony with a reading or uh, out loud of the entire Bible. So we started out Sunday evening. It was quite an experience. It was nonstop. Uh, volunteers, a person would read a chapter, someone else would read another chapter. Some people had signed up for certain times and not for certain chapters because we didn't know exactly where we would be. But uh, we started reading through the Bible. This went on through Sunday night, through Monday, through Monday night, through Tuesday, through Tuesday, through uh, Tuesday night, always somebody we had, always someone reading. And it was amazing, even in the dead of night, two, three in the morning, there would be people standing in line waiting to read a chapter from the Bible. It took us 74 hours to read completely through the scriptures, starting with Genesis down to the end of the book of Revelation. And uh, people could read from any translation they wanted to. Some people have a favorite translation. And also, they could read in another language if they wanted to, bringing the Bible they were familiar with. So uh, there was someone who read in Mandarin, another one read in Polish, another one read in Tagalog, and so on. And I thought it would be wonderful if we could have, when we were going through the Old Testament, chapter by chapter, 1,189 chapters read in 74 hours. I thought it would be wonderful if we could have a rabbi come and read us a chapter <coughs> from the Old Testament a chapter in Hebrew. Since we had some other languages, why not a language in which most of the Bible was written? 77% of the Bible, Old Testament. Well, uh, I found a rabbi who was more than gracious in coming and read a chapter from the Old Testament in Hebrew. And so we went through the entire Bible in 74 hours, starting Sunday, ending on Wednesday evening. We read right through the prayer meeting, which we didn't have because we were still reading, reading the Bible and dedicating the building, the sanctuary, of the church to the word of God, the word of the Lord, which was going to be proclaimed under its roof for many years following. So again, the cooperation from our Jewish friends helped make that a memorable experience and to make it possible. Now, Something else, we all love Christmas. We, we Christian people. And uh, Christmas is uh, a children's program. It's decorations in the church building. Christmas is meeting with relatives. Christmas is gifts. It's a special dinner. It's just a special, very special time of the year. And certainly, one of the great Christian festivals on the Christian calendar throughout the year. However, did you ever think about it? Christmas 
is Jewish. <laughs> no, uh, if it were not for the Jewish people, we Christians would not have a Christmas to celebrate. Nazareth, where Mary and Joseph lived, was a Jewish town. So was Bethlehem, famed little village, of course. Even a Christians writing songs about it, old little town of Bethlehem. Joseph was Jewish. Mary was Jewish. The angel that came with the announcement that Christ was to be born, the angel that came to Mary was not Irish. His name was not McNally. It was Gabriel, a Hebrew name. Ah, the angel was Jewish. What else? Oh, all the way through. The innkeeper. The innkeeper was Jewish. Yes. And the shepherds who came to worship the Christ child, they were all Jewish tending flocks from which lambs would be brought to be sacrificed in the temple at Jerusalem. So the whole cast of characters at the first Christmas, they were all Jewish. When Christmas comes around again, take a moment to thank God for the Jewish people. And if you know someone, a neighbor, someone at work, someone who is Jewish, uh, go out of your way to, to thank them for, for Christmas. Even though the Jews don't celebrate it, maybe some of them have forgotten that Christmas was Jewish, which reminds me of the Jewish man whose boy was pestering the life out of him because the kids' friends all had Christmas trees. And he was begging his Jewish father for a Christmas tree, but to no avail, no Christmas tree. But one day, his dad came home dragging behind him an evergreen. The boys jumping up and down and almost dancing, saying, oh, goody, goody, we have a Christmas tree, we have a Christmas tree. His father very sternly is responding to him, no, it is not a Christmas tree. It's a Hanukkah bush. Oh, oh my. Uh, Hanukkah is that Jewish festival that's never mentioned in the Bible because it comes between the Testaments. It's when the, uh, the Maccabees and Judas Maccabeus and his brothers got the temple back from the Gentile, the heathen, and were able to get it worked up and worshiping again and light light the menorah, the seven-branch candlestick in the temple. And so Hanukkah is the Jewish festival never mentioned in the Bible because it fell in between the two testaments uh, as the Feast of Lights. And so uh, that's the closest that our Jewish friends get to celebrating Christmas. But remember, we have a great debt to our Jewish friends, to the Jewish people who actually gave us the Bible. We would have no Bible if it weren't for the Jews and who gave us the one that we love and adore, Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
who was born of a Jewish mother and had a Jewish foster father and had Jewish half-brothers and half-sisters and himself lived as a Jew as a boy went and got the education that all the other boys got and who at 12 was found in the temple with the learned uh, doctors asking them questions and talking with them. Jesus Christ, who was himself a Jew, God's gift to the world, to the world, his son, who gave his life upon the cross for you, for me, for everyone, so that Judaism breaks out of the box, out of the bonds, out of its being circumscribed to become a, a significant for the entire human race because Jesus, the Jew, died upon the cross. And what you do with him determines where you will spend eternity. This life is short. Uh, almost no matter if you live into your 90s, I'm 95, if you live into your 90s and it, life seems so long that no, no, these years will be like seconds as eternity begins to unfold. It is timeless. And where you spend eternity, whether in heaven or in the torment of hell, depends on whether or not you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You say, how do I do that? Well, you just from your heart ask him to come into your life, into your thinking, into your emotions, into your whole person, and save you from your sins so that you can be cleansed and be prepared to go to heaven and spend eternity with God the Father the Holy Spirit, and God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ.